Hello, everybody. Great to be back with you in our study of the book of James. Today, we're going to look at James 3, 13 through 16. And uh, before we get started, I want to have a word of prayer with you. Father God, I thank you for the privilege of gathering together to study your word. We pray, Father God, that you would just open our hearts to your truth. Holy Spirit, that you would convict and convince and show us areas in our own lives where we maybe need to work on things. And I pray, Father, that today's Bible study would be helpful and encouraging uh, to us as we seek to live out the uh, faithful Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today, like I said, we want to look at James 3, 13 through 16. We're not going to get all the way through chapter 3. I want to save 17 and 18 for a later date because... Uh, there's just so much there that I think is very, uh, we want to do some comparison to some other passages of Scripture, so we'll come back to that. But anyway, today we want to look at verses uh, 13 through 16. Last week we looked at the folly of the tongue. It is so small, yet gets us in so much trouble. With the tr tongue, he said, we praise God, and with the same tongue, we curse men. He even gave us a word picture to, does a uh, a spring bring forth salty water, or does salty water turn into good water, whatever. I mean, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't, you know, the fruit of a tree, and he gives us those illustrations. Uh, no, we need to understand that we are to use our tongues to build up. James said that the man, a man is able to tame all kinds of animals. He can tame lions and tigers and dogs and elephants and all sorts of things. But the one thing we can't seem to tame is our tongue. It's just about time I think I've got my tongue under control, then it surprises me. And uh, I say something that I regret and I have to go back and apologize or I uh, say something hastily that I wish I could reel it back in and uh, not say it. I, I one time heard a story about uh, a, guy, a, a person who came to their priest and said that they wanted to confess that they were or gossip, and they've been gossiping, and uh, wanted the priest to forgive them for it and give them penance. Of course, it's just a story, but so the priest said, no, before I uh, pray for you, I want you to take and put a feather on every step, every doorstep in our village. I want you to put a feather on every doorstep. Well, the person went out and did that, and then came back and said, I did my task. I put a feather on every doorstop in the village doorstep of the village and now you know pray for me and the priest said no you're not done yet now I want you to go back and get all those feathers collect them all up and the person said well I won't be able to do that because the wind will have blown them everywhere he said that's precisely the problem with gossip that's precisely the problem actually for a tongue because we never know where all this is going to go how many people will hurt? Uh, how many people will misunderstand? So we need to be very careful about what we say, how we say it. Uh, so in order to combat that, we need to ask God to cleanse our lips. A little bit like the prophet Isaiah, who said he was a man of unclean lips, and God purged his tongue, cleansed it. We need to pray that we will that God will help us guard what we say, that we'll bring our tongues under control. And then finally, we need to use our tongues to build others up. And that's a very conscious decision. Am I building others up by the things I say? Unfortunately, there's a lot of television out there that uses cutting and snide remarks to get humor, but it doesn't build others up. We need to be careful. Well, today we're going to talk about who is wise. Who is wise and understanding? We're looking at chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and every evil practice. Well, today we want to look at who is wise and understanding among you. 
That's a great question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Some people appear to be wise, but then when you get close to them, you realize that uh, they really don't have the corner on the market on wisdom. Second Chronicles 1 7 tells the story of the account of Solomon. It says, That night God appeared to Solomon and said, Ask whatever you want me to give you. Wow. That's a that's a that's a an incredible opportunity. Solomon answered God, You have shown great kindness to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord, let your promise to my father David be confirmed, for you have made me king over a people who are as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? God said to Solomon, Since this is your heart to desire, and you have not asked for wealth, riches, or honor, nor the death of your enemies, and since you have not asked for a long life, but for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people, over whom I made you king, therefore wisdom and knowledge will be given you, and I will also give you wealth, riches, and honor, such as no king who was before you ever had and none after will have. Tragically, Solomon was a lot like Samson. He forgot the source of his wisdom. Uh, he forgot that God was the ultimate source of his wisdom, and he let his own wisdom and knowledge lead him into wrong areas. You know, one of the things we have to be careful about is Satan is a counterfeiter. He's going to try and counterfeit certain things and entice us into decisions that are not wise. They're not of God. So we need to be very careful. Tragically, uh, so when we look at this, wisdom is understanding what is true, what is right, what is lasting, what has common sense to it, good judgment. Wisdom is taking knowledge and applying it in a life circumstance. Wisdom is understanding what is true, right, lasting, common sense, good judgment. Being wise doesn't mean we understand everything that is going on because our superior knowledge, but that we do right things as life comes along. In other words, some of the things that my grandfather and my father taught me were good, solid, wise things to do. And now I'm trying to implement them in the way I help my children and my grandchildren and uh, so putting that knowledge into practical use. One of the ways to get wisdom is first of all out of a reverence for God, a reverence of God. Psalms 111 verse 10 says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of a holy one is understanding. So as we reverence God, as we fear God, as we turn our attention, we are going to get understanding and we're going to get wisdom. Job 28.28 says, And he said to man, The fear of the Lord is, this is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. So Job and the book of Job is telling us you, you not only need wisdom, but you need to be ready to shun what is evil. When we see God for who he is, he is holy and awesome, loving and sovereign. Embrace a, uh, and when we embrace a proper fear of him, we're on the doorway to wisdom. We enter that doorway when we admit our own finiteness and an, an inability to direct our lives. Wow. One day I was driving behind a big truck, you know, one of those big semis, and well, it was a kind of hilly road and up and down, and I thought, you know, I'd like to get around him, but I can't see. I don't really have the insight. And uh, all at once I realized that's why it's so important for us to walk with Christ, because he sees down the road so much further than we could. If I could just talk to that truck driver, I might have known what was on up ahead, but, but I couldn't. So we need to trust God and walk with him and trust him. Uh, Proverbs eleven two 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. So as we humble ourselves in reverence and awe of God, he will embrace us with his wisdom. Tragic, 
tragically, Christians in their desire to be relevant and relational in their worship have minimized the awesomeness of God and have falsely maximized their own virtue and importance. Now, you know, when you think about it, God is the creator of all things. He has breathed life into this world. And when we get above our raisin, that's what we used to say back home, we start getting too head up about ourselves and who we are. You know, what, what's the scripture says? Pride goes before the fall. So we need to have a reverence for God. Secondly, conversion. Paul uses the phrase, in Christ, uh, in reference to Christians, that we are in Christ. He supposedly uses it 161 times in his writings. This phrase indicates the type of relationship we have with God. We have been grafted into the family of God, adopted into the family of God by the virtue and the blood of Jesus Christ, by his desire and fulfillment and obedience to the Father. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we have wisdom, and by being in Christ, uh, I think someone said in Christo, in Christ, we have this wisdom available to us. Since all God's wisdom is found in Christ, so when we came to Christ, we came to be in Christ, we become rooted in wisdom. Our relationship assures us of this transfer of wisdom and opens us to our continued wisdom of Christ. So if there's one thing we need to do, we need to have a reverence and fear of God. That's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom or the beginning of wisdom. But we also have to be in Christ because then the wisdom of Christ becomes available to us. Rooted in Christ, we become rooted in wisdom. But a third place we find wisdom is found in the scriptures. Psalms 119, 97 through 100 says, Oh, how I love your laws. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than elders, for I obey your precepts. So it's not a matter of just hearing God's commands, but it's about applying God's commands, applying his laws and being obedient to him. There's wisdom in that. It's a pathway to wisdom. Colossians 3, 16 through 17 says, let the word of the Lord dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So when you look at that verse, it says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. We're pretty safe when we stick to the word of God. Some One time somebody asked me why I have so much scripture in my sermon. Because that's the one thing I trust is the word of God. I don't trust my own philosophies. I don't trust my own limited knowledge and wisdom. But I do trust the word of God. And the word of God has all kinds of directions and hope. Since all God's wisdom is found in Christ, since it's found in a reverence for him, we need to also find it in the scriptures. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, Psalms 119 says, and a light unto my path. Wow, there's never a right way to do the wrong thing, someone said. But when we know God's word, it tells us the right things to do, and it also tells us the wrong things to do. How much time do you actually spend in God's word? You know, I fear that sometimes we do the fan method. We get the Bible and we go like that, and we fan it, we think we've had our devotions. Or sometimes we're on such a bent to follow a reading outline, you know, one of those year-to-year -year things, that we don't take time to really stop and reflect upon the Word of God. Or we don't make God 
uh, word of priority. We, we read it to get it done to make sure we get our checklist off for the day. Matter of fact, sometimes I'm tired and I uh, sometimes miss the scriptures. I'll read it, but, I, but then I go back to it. And so one of the things I've done over the years is I keep journals. The other thing is, uh, one of the things I've been doing recently is whatever I read in the morning, I go back and reread it the night before I go to bed. And I let it kind of sink in during the day. Well, another way to find wisdom is through prayer. James 1.5 says, If any one of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. God wants you to have wisdom. He offers it ungrudgingly, and we must simply ask for it. The formula for wisdom is pretty simple. But, you know, I got to spend a few days with my grandsons the other day. I hadn't seen them since the pandemic, and we've been trying to keep ourselves cloistered away from everybody. And little Levi, he's three years old, had a birthday. Well, you know, I'm not used to being around three-year-olds, but that little guy had, I don't know how many questions for me. Wanted to know about this. Always wanted to experiment and look at things and be part of them. And it was really a lot of fun. And I thought, boy, as a granddad, as a grandfather, I want to share all my wisdom with him. We were teaching him about tools and he wanted to be right there with us as we were working on things. But sometimes when you're running some equipment, they can't be too close. But helping him to understand the dangers, the risk, and helping to understand why we do things. You know, if, if I do that for my grandsons, and I only love them, I mean, I love them like a grandpa, but I don't have infinite love like God has. And if God loves them, and God loves us, as we know, he wants to lavish us with his wisdom. So when we think about it, wisdom, the formula for finding wisdom is pretty simple. Number one, it's found in the reverence and fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. Receiving Christ, who is wisdom from God, that's the beginning of wisdom. The scriptures convey the wisdom of God, being in God's word day in, day out. Prayer brings the wisdom, wisdom for the asking, if we but only ask. Um, he goes on, in our passage, he said, let it show it by, he who is wise is, it says, let him show it by his good life and by the deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. So as we move further into this passage, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. So there are two qualities that demonstrate real wisdom. Number one is a good life a noble and a beautiful life of honoring. Uh, how do we honor one another? How do we live in a noble life that's above reproach? But it's also demonstrated by deeds done in humility. Some confuse weakness as, uh, some confuse humility as a form of weakness. Uh, when in actuality, uh, Wisdom is strength under control. It's, it's how we control what we know and use it to bring glory. So humility is strength under control, and we need that wisdom to help us not do it. Numbers 12.3 speaks of Moses this way. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. You know, Moses, according to Scripture, was a humble man, but when you think about it, I thought he was a very powerful man, a very influential man. So we find wisdom by deeds done in humility. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will ask and you will, fi you will find, uh, let me go back and say that again, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you think of yourself as wise? Is your life picture uh, a picture of pride or a composite of gentleness, meekness, mildness? The wise know that God is in control. They know who they are as a redeemed sinner. They can meet their enemies 
with the knowledge that God will take care of them and God will vindicate them. And it goes on, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. I was thinking about that. One of the verses that we promote a lot here in this church is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which are really a, a, a layout of the plan of salvation. For it is by grace, God's unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. Faith is which is a total transference of trust, of trusting in God. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Not by works so that no one can boast. Uh, there's no bragging rights in heaven. But it goes on to say, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has work for us to do. And we need to understand that. And uh, we need to um, understand that we are created to do works. And as a matter of fact, you know, he says, uh, by deeds done in humility, understanding that we need to walk on a humble, loving, joyful life in Christ and that uh, that life uh, bears forth fruit. There is a false wisdom. If you go back to our text, it says in verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny it. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, un unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So we have a false wisdom, uh, a false wisdom. And what we see in that is a false wisdom is indicated by bitter envy. Someone said it's a harsh zeal. <laughs> they, they could not, a person who has this bitter envy can't stand it to see others possess the position or the recognition or the influence that they so desire. And as a result, they would seek to subvert what the other person is doing. I read a story about a couple of men. I thought it was pretty a good illustration of what I call this, this uh, bitter envy. The story is told of two men who lived in a certain city. One was envious and the other covetous. The ruler of the city sent for them and said he wanted to grant them one wish each. With this provisio, the, the one who chose first would get exactly what he asked for, while the other would get exactly twice what the first had asked for himself. The, the envious man was ordered to choose first, but immediately found himself in a quandary. He wanted to choose something great for himself, but realized that if he did so, the other would get twice as much. He thought for a while, then he asked that, uh, then he asked that one of his eyes. <laughs> so after he thought about it, this is what he came up with. It's hard to believe, but he asked that one of his eyes would be put out, meaning that the other man would have both his eyes put out. In the church, this person, this type of person could honestly pray, Lord, I would sooner your work uh, was not done at all than done by someone better than I can do it. <laughs> well, that's kind of a bizarre illustration, but there are people who actually act that way and think that way. The evil twin of bitter envy is selfish ambition. This can be witnessed sometimes in the politics of organizations. You can see people who are promoted to a position and the others are envious of them and they don't cooperate, they don't work together. And as a result, <clears throat> I've seen this in sports. When you see an athlete that's really how'd you say, um, better, who are really having great success, and the rest of the team players won't pass the ball to them, won't cooperate with them. But anyway, what we have here is the evil twin of bitter envy of selfish ambition. Uh, Philippians 1, 17 through 18 kind of picks up on this. It says, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So the question is, 
what is the rationale? What is the heart of what we're trying to do? Are we trying to serve God out of a love for others or out of a way to promote ourselves, a way to build us up? In our hearts, are we building others up or in our earthly wisdom justifying the negative way we tear others down to promote ourselves? I suppose there's a little bit of that in all of us. We need to bring it under the blood of Christ. Verse 15 says, Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder of every evil practice and every evil practice. Envy and strife are clear indicators that one so-called wisdom is not from above, but is earthly, unspiritual. In other words, earthly, unspiritual, it's natural, it's it's essential it's of, our, of ourselves. It's fed by our own sensual desires. And it goes on to say, and of the devil or the demonic. Envy and selfish ambition or rivalry, rivalry can only produce disorder or confusion and every evil practice. A truly wise person does not seek glory or gain. He is gracious and giving. The end result of such envy and selfish ambition is disorder and confusion and every evil practice. The bottom line is that Satan is behind selfish ambition and bitter envy. So who do we serve? Do we serve the evil? Or do we serve ourselves? Are we obedient to Christ? Or are we walking in his wisdom or are we walking in the way of the world the wisdom of the world verses 17 through 18 which we'll look at it at a different date says but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure then peace loving considerate submissive full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace raise the harvest of righteousness so maybe we can recap for a moment. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life. Wow. How is your life demonstrating the wisdom of God? That's a good question to ask. Uh, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter and envy and selfish ambition, the evil twins in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. I guess maybe the bottom line is, who do I want to most represent? Do I want my own way and my own selfish ambition? Or do I want the ways of God that will last for eternity? Do you want your life? to be known for its corruption, or do you want it to be known for the blessing that you can become? Well, God bless you. I look forward to seeing you soon. Hope you will uh, think about the things we've talked about today.